Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Tim Lachuk. I'm a uh, PhD student here in uh, Professor Frank Gu's lab in chemical engineering at the uh, Waterloo Institute for Nanotechnology. Um, I actually did my undergrad uh, degree in the nanoengineering program uh, here at Waterloo. Yeah, lots of, lots of nano, lots of familiar faces from uh, when I TA'd any 100. So good to see everyone uh, out here today. Um, I think it's really cool that a research conference can attract so many people on a Saturday. Um, a, a beautiful Saturday, no less. Um, so I have to say the reason I uh, chose to do my undergrad in NanoEng um, here was the fact that it is something new. It is something cool. Uh, we've heard a lot of talks already and lots of posters on people reinventing things from the ground up. Um, and uh, I, I feel it's true for most of you as well that the reason you guys chose Nano was, I guess, to invent new things. Um, like making bridges is OK. I'm certainly glad there are people in this world who can engineer a bridge. Um, but the excitement in, in my uh, eyes is the convergence of like physics, biology, electronics. Um, and trying to get all that to work together to solve really um, problems that haven't been addressed yet. Um, so the problem I'm trying to address is uh, environmental in nature. Um, so at least in the undergrad program here at Waterloo, you guys are told uh, there are four sectors of nano, right? There is uh, nanoelectronics, nanobio, nano instruments, and nanomaterials. Um, I'd like to propose that uh, nano-environmental uh, be added to that list, um, or hopefully in the future it might be, because I see some enormous uh, applications of nanotechnology for environmental cleanup. Uh, so the Canadian oil sands, uh, for those of you who may or may not be familiar, it is probably one of the largest uh, environmental challenges in Canada. Uh, they have a billion tons of uh, what is called oil sands process affected water, uh, or OSPW for short, stored in these massive tailings ponds uh, on site in Alberta uh, to contain the water. Why do they need to contain it? It's because it is uh, toxic to many forms of life. They can't actually release it into the environment. Uh, so they're just holding on to it until they find a solution. Uh, what's in this water that makes it um, such a problem? Uh, well, it's, it's a very complex mix of all sorts of things. Uh, the, what's commonly been identified as the toxic problematic bit, though, is called naphthenic acids. And that is uh, what you can see on the, on the left-hand side there. Um, they are these kind of squiggly organic molecules. They have branches. They have ring structures. and uh, the theory, at least, is they'll get all up in your cell membranes and mess them up. So since most living things have cells, um, this has been uh, shown to be toxic to many, uh, many types of assays they have tested this against. So they're, they're holding it in these ponds. Um, this has a cost. This has an environmental liability. Um, when they are done in, in a few decades, done extracting all the oil from the oil sands, uh, these ponds will still be left in Alberta um, unless they find a solution to clean them up. Uh, so there have been a number of technologies that have been um, investigated to try and treat the toxicity in this water and allow it to be handled or used for other applications. Um, so conventional water treatment technologies, things like adsorption, uh, the one they were really hoping in was biodegradation. Just let this stuff sit there for decades and hope the problem goes away on its own. Um, that they, they did that, and it, uh, 20, 30 years later, it's, the toxicity hasn't gone away. These naphthenic acids are extremely uh, persistent pollutants in the environment. And so I think the consensus recently is that something has to be done um, actively to address this. There are a few technologies on this list that uh, have been shown to work that can actually reduce the toxicity of the OSPW. Um, the ones that do work, though, are really impractically expensive given the scale of the problem. A billion tons is an easy term to throw around, but uh, the scale is just really um, hard to imagine. 
so why nano? Um, what, what my research is in and what I find very interesting is uh, the idea of recyclable nanoparticles. Um, so I'm looking at what are called uh, photocatalysts. So most of you are probably familiar with the idea of a catalyst. It accelerates a reaction without itself being consumed in the process. Um, so the idea is to apply nanotechnology, apply a small amount of a photocatalytic material that will work away on these pollutants and just never itself be used up. So that has the potential, in our view, to kind of sidestep some of these cost issues. You uh, use some nanoparticles, and they will just keep working away. But how does this specific system work? Um, it is actually a lot like uh, what Paul presented. You can actually call these quantum dots if you want. Uh, we call them photocatalysts because uh, that sounds cool, too. Um, <laughs> but basically, they, they have a, a band gap. They absorb light. Um, and create an electron hole pair. However, when you put these particles in water, uh, the electron hole pair goes to the surface of these nanoparticles, reacts with pollutants or water itself to create very powerful free radicals, which then go out and uh, start ripping apart uh, organic pollutants, such as naphthenic acids. Um, I'll point out that these free radicals produced uh, by these photocatalytic nanoparticles are quite a bit more powerful than chlorine. Uh, the valence band holes on TiO2 are actually far more powerful than the top thing in that table. Uh, so what this means is they can rip apart uh, pollutants that uh, conventional oxidation treatments can't actually touch. So the reason these naphthenic acids are so persistent um, is they are very hard to uh, break down by conventional means. We thought uh, TiO2 is one of the most powerful oxidizers out there, and uh, we thought it would be up to the challenge. So I've really talked up um, photocatalysis and, and why it's so great. So why isn't it being used all the time everywhere to clean up any water? Why do we still have water treatment uh, issues? Um, from our view, the, the key challenges are uh, recyclability of the material. So actually pulling nanoparticles out of water so they don't become a pollutant themselves is actually pretty challenging. Um, and also, for that cost issue, you want to reuse these particles over and over. Um, another idea is just raw efficiency. So we want to power these particles by sunlight. So you want to make sure they have a good overlap with the solar spectrum in their absorption. And that is, again, something nano nanotechnology can help with. Um, I just want to quickly uh, touch on um, some work I actually did in undergrad over my co-op terms in uh, Prof. Gu's lab um, to address that recyclability need. So we thought, man, these nanoparticles, they're in the water, they've treated the water, the water is clean, but how do you get the nanoparticles to come back out um, so you can actually use that water? Uh, we were like, man, if only there was a force that we could you know, latch onto them and get them to come towards you if only they were magnetic. Um, and so we decided to put a magnet in them. Um, <laughs> so that's what you can see in, in that little photo at the bottom. The idea is you sprinkle these uh, nanoparticles in the water. They have a TiO2, which is the photocatalyst shell, coated on the outside of the nanoparticles with a magnetic core. Um, and then when they've done their work, when they've degraded the contaminants, you just apply a magnetic field, and they come out of the water. And I used the word super paramagnetic on the slide. That is another expensive word. But what it basically means is an on-off magnetic switch. Um, so they're only magnetic in the presence of a magnetic field. So unlike fridge magnets, uh, they can go out into their water. They won't be interacting with each other. But when you want to call them back, you turn on their magnetism, and they'll, they'll come in. So that is, again, kind of another benefit of nano. Um, so these are some pretty pictures of uh, basically what the particles look like um, and uh, some indications as to their recyclability. So it's a bit like batteries. You do the test over and over. And because they're a catalyst, they're supposed to behave the same each time. So that, that figure isn't, isn't that recyclable, but we're still working on that. But anyways, back to the problem at hand. Can TiO2 degrade naphthenic acids in oil sands process water? The answer is yes. Um, actually, last summer, summer 2014, 
um, up on the roof of one of the buildings here on campus, we actually put out some beakers of OSPW we received fresh from Alberta. Um, we dumped in some of the uh, photo catalyst and we left it out in the sun to see what would happen. Um, and it actually worked extremely well within only one day, and that's what the figure on the, uh, the left there shows, uh, we see an exponential decay of all the naphthenic acids in the uh, oil sands process water. And keep in mind that these are pollutants that have a, a natural half-life of decades in the environment. So going from decades to, to hours or minutes was extremely exciting for us. Um, and I'll also point out that we used raw oil sands process water. So it had mud, it had clays, and, and junk floating around in it. Uh, but it seems that the absorption of the nanoparticles, the light absorbance, was sufficient to uh, still uh, activate the treatment. Um, I'll, I'll move things along pretty quickly here. What this figure shows, it's a bit messy, is uh, basically we completely eliminated all the carbon in the water, and the uh, carbon that was left in the water was more biodegradable than it started, and it started out as not biodegradable. Um, so all these are good things in, in terms of treatment. And this is an even fancier picture of a mass spec, but um, you're, you want to compare figure A to figure C, uh, you can see in the upper right quadrant that little cluster disappears, and those are actually the most complex molecular structures, so kind of the most number of rings, the largest, most branch structures, which are actually the most persistent naphthenic acids. So yeah, we were able to get rid of those too. Uh, what's next? Um, in our view, we've uh, kind of answered or been answering some of the science questions uh, it seems that scale up, basically how will this process actually work at some of the scales required, is really the, the biggest question remaining. Um, so just this last summer, we actually formed a startup spin-off company, uh, which is of course the Waterloo thing to do. Um, but we're calling it H2 Nano, and uh, the idea of this company is we are going to uh, be the intermediate step between good lab ideas and large scale implementations of nano-enabled environmental solutions. Um, so if, uh, if you have some great uh, nanotechnology ideas for environmental cleanup or protection, uh, we'd love to talk to you. <laughs> um, and, and maybe this, this uh, startup will be a stepping stone uh, to enable that. So those photos are some of the tests we did just this last summer on uh, uh, testing up to a, a one ton scale of uh, water treatment, which is a bit bigger than uh, beakers you typically work with in the lab. And yeah, so that's the fun of it for me. It's actually the challenge is uh, all us nano engineers in the room are always thinking really small, like smaller than a micron, uh, and the oil sands are kilometers in size. And it's like, how do you, how do you merge the two? How do you bring nano to real life? So uh, hopefully you guys are equally inspired about everything you're working on and uh, you have a lot of potential and uh, hopefully you enjoy the program and uh, do some good, good work after. Thank you.